For over three decades, the big island of Hawaii has been home to the world's most grueling day in sport, the Ironman World Championship. Hundreds of thousands of athletes around the globe are driven by the same goal, to earn a spot on the start line in Kona. Today, only 1,900 have that chance. Everyone comes prepared. But crazy things can happen out there. Mental, physical, mechanical. Iron Man athletes aren't like those who watch. For them, this isn't a sport. For them, Iron Man is a way of life. The majority are here to finish, and most of them will one way or the other. But for an elite few, this is a job. For the favorites, race week in Kona is a hectic balance of training, tapering, relaxing, eating, sleeping, and handling the media and business of the sport. It is all for one day that defines a year, and in some cases, a lifetime. Thirty-nine-year-old, three-time world champion Craig Alexander comes to Kona conflicted. As a father of two children and expecting a third, the 2011 Ironman winner tries to find balance between world champion and dad. You know, your perspective changes in life, particularly as you get older and particularly when you become a parent. Other things become more important. Your family's one of those things. It's an interesting sort of paradox, I guess, because almost by definition, as an athlete and a professional athlete, you do need to be selfish. You become self-absorbed. It's one of the prerequisites for success. But I guess, yeah, there can be collateral damage because it's the kind of existence where there's a lot of internal focus and that's kind of contrary to what happens when you have a family. No doubt, I overstep the mark sometimes. I know what's required for success here. It's a single-minded focus, and unless you have it, you're wasting your time. You might as well not even show up. I think it's part of the triathlete's psyche. You really want to test the boundaries. You want to get to the edge and almost look over it to find out where it is, and sometimes you don't know where it is until you've overstepped it. Chris McCormack's journey to Kona was put on hold until June of this year. The former world champion spent last season chasing another dream, the London Olympics. But when he failed to qualify, he shifted focus to this event he's won twice before. Taking a year off from Kona, I think, was a nice break. Taking that year off and being able to view the race as a spectator, something I hadn't done for a decade, was refreshing and it gave me a taste of saying, you know what, I wouldn't mind rolling the dice at that thing again. I'm very content with what I've achieved athletically. You always want to achieve more and, and you feel that you can be competitive still. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think I could still win here again. I know the pressure that goes around that, your own self-doubts, your own fears, your own insecurities, your own question marks over whether you've got what it takes to be competitive here. You know, in years past, look what I've turned to to do it. I've picked arguments with competitors. I've tried to put them off mentally. I can do so much physically, but if you can get an edge in any way, you take that edge. And I don't regret for one minute going about it the way I did it because I got two titles in an event that the greatest sports scientists in the world told me I'd never ever win. So when I turn up to an event like this, I'm asked the question, um, what are you hoping to achieve? Well, I've just spent 16 weeks dismissing hope. I came here to win, I don't hope for anything. For 2010 women's champion, Marinda Carfrey, Returning to Kona recalls a familiar emotion, fear. I was really nervous in my first year. It was my first ever Ironman. I'd never run a marathon. 
I decided to go in um, ignorant to what I was actually going to face. So I was going to do a marathon at the end of, you know, a five-hour bike ride um, and a you know, 2.4-mile swim. I was scared, nervous, uh, probably isn't the right word. I was downright just petrified. I was some young rookie hoping that I could make it to the finish line in one piece. But I was just surprised and very pleased with myself to make it into second place. The following year, Marinda won here, setting the marathon course record. Last year, she finished second, and even with that success, race week brings anxiety. As soon as you get on the island, it's this sort of time that you sort of questioning whether you've done enough work, whether you're ready. It's definitely a nervous time. been doing triathlon for such a long time that it's all I know. It's just an automatic thing to do is to get up the next day and go training. It's almost like an addiction. I feel part of that is the ability to keep wanting to push yourself when everything says that you shouldn't be. At age 34, British triathlete Leander Cave is in peak form. Just one month ago in September, she won the 70.3 Ironman World Championship. Now she has a confident edge, trying to become the first woman ever to win both Ironman titles in the same year. This is my 20th year doing triathlon. I'm racing better than I've ever raced. I definitely have something that I feel that I recognize that a lot of other people don't have because I was never the best runner or the best swimmer or the best biker. But I feel over the years, compounding that training and the racing that I've done, I feel that now I am one of those athletes who has that talent. I've also become to realize that because of that, I scare a lot, a lot of my fellow competition off, which is great. Because <laughs> I used to be scared of other athletes and very intimidated by other athletes when I was coming through the ranks and it's kind of nice to be that athlete who people are scared of for a change. I earned it. Marinda Carfrey is a gifted athlete, a natural first as a basketball player and now as a triathlete. She has excelled in sports. But talent alone doesn't win championships on the Big Island. Winning here requires a singular year-long vision. I think originally I got into the sport because I wanted to go to the Olympics for triathlon. And then pretty quickly after that, I heard it of the Ironman triathlon and, and in particular this race. And Everything from that moment, which was very early on in my career, was about getting ready to race here in Kona. I often think that this sport is crazy. I mean, who, who thought up the idea that, you know, let's race for nine hours as hard as we can. And let's put it in Kona where it's super hot and super windy and super humid. There's definitely maybe something a little bit wrong with Ironman athletes. It's a tough sport, but uh, I guess you have to have that personality. That personality that wants to know what your limits are. That's searching for, I guess, the ultimate challenge. This is what I train for, this is what I live for, this race. In 2011, Great Britain's Leander Cave finished third here, her best career result in six Kona tries. Her race week approach is simple and direct, yet somewhat guarded. Shh. I definitely have my own take on 
things, you know, in the universe. One of the hardest things that people do is to actually switch off everything in their head and just actually be physically in the moment and I'm pretty good at doing that. I don't take myself too seriously, I let other people do that. <laughs> Everyone who knows me behind the scenes know that I'm a little more chill than I come across. Oh, I'm giving away my secret. Um, <laughs> give, I don't give much away on, on game day and that's the way I like it. I like to surprise people. I don't see competition on race day, I see my enemies and I want to kill them. Kind of, not really. For three-time champion Craig Alexander, race week involves a few priorities, like getting rid of the grey. A couple of formalities, some grooming, had a haircut, which has uh, become a bit of a tradition for me. Race week, I like to get the buzz cut. Gets rid of all the grey highlights. Yeah, that's good, that's better. Thank you, yeah. yeah thank you very much. Sorry to be a pest. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to get back to the hotel. Had a little bit of downtime with the kids and Neri at the pool, which is always nice. Obviously, you don't get to do as much of that as you'd like in race week. I think one of my great strengths is that I know my many weaknesses. And one of them is I wouldn't survive without Neri and the kids around. I get a lot of strength and motivation from having them. And it's a hard sport in that regard. Actually, Crowey, he's looking fit and ready. Very relaxed this year. He has never seen the anger that this island can deliver with winds and, uh, and heat, especially out in those lava fields, because we haven't had super difficult conditions since 2004. Experience. Nine Kona Ironman events, two world championships, and that's just part of the edge that Chris McCormack hopes to play against his chief rival, Race Day. The other pre-race move is more psychological, a bit of gamesmanship, publicly casting doubt in Alexander's pre-race form. Now, if I'm looking for a weakness in Crowley, I'm hoping it's the back end of the marathon. He struggled here. I'm not going to be talked out of anything. I'm not going to be intimidated. Speed kills, and uh, I've got a lot of that at the moment. I can close that. I don't take anything that's said or, or written personally. His last six miles last year were horrible. He fell apart. This is a professional sport. We're trying to win. The other weakness could be with Crowley is you need to have four titles. Is three enough? I'm like an old rhino, I've got a thick skin. None of the talk bothers me. You know, we've had three wars here and I've knocked him out twice. Why can't it be three? He's been around racing this race a long time. He's had success here. But like I said, you know, and this is not disrespectful to me. Santa Claus could be on the start line next to me. It doesn't make any difference. As race day draws closer, the pros are faced with distractions, and it's all part of the business. I started my day today with a swim at the pier down on the race course. Got in the water very early and swam for about an hour and then went headlong into a string of interviews. It's a fine line because it's great for the sport to have the media exposure and as an individual athlete, it's a platform to get sponsorship and for your own branding. You have to make yourself available. You can't just disappear. The closer the race gets, the, the more I try to stay indoors and stay sort of away from the craziness and excitement. Let's rehearse how you're going to transition now. I've got to go down there and do a couple of sponsorship obligations. It's good to get down there and sort of get amongst it, but just for a short amount of time trying to have your body absolutely 100% recovered before you step on the start line. We're waiting for Leander Cave. Siri, is Leander coming? There's so many things that go on in the day leading up to the race, all the commitments with sponsors and media and so forth. I don't really get a whole lot of time to think to myself and be too concerned about how things are. The spotlight becomes on you and Obviously with interviews and a lot of media and then sponsors, they all want to talk and have a piece of you. Do you want to be in the middle? Can you in the middle? No, I'll let Chrissy have the spotlight since she's racing, not. Uh, breakfast will be just oatmeal. Yeah. Certainly have been asking for this. It's just so much. I don't like I have to sit there and, you know, do the same question. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Why wouldn't I be ready? It's the bloody world championships. Are you kidding? If I'm not ready now, then when the hell am I going to be ready? You know? I need to just escape that sometimes. 
For two-time Ironman world champion Chris McCormack, the pre-race buildup is an opportunity to do what he does best, spread the word from the man called Macca. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go. Been here for a lot of years, and know that I can get a little bit, a bit of a diva in the, in the, in the days getting closer to the race. How are you, boys? Last year before the race, I'm like, oh, good luck, mate. To be honest with you, I need the chaos. You know, everyone has a strategy until they get hit in the face. <laughs> My run is uh, so much better than it ever was. Like, I've never regretted anything I've ever said. You know, I'm a man who speaks my mind because they're my goals, they're my objectives. And, you know, I've been in this sport for 20 years, so a lot of people know you or feel like they know you because they've been around the sport for a long time. And you like to give those people time. Stir it up a little. <laughs> I always Five, think that, you know, to the outside world, this is entertainment. But for people living this, this is my life. And then these are my dreams at the moment. I'm scarily feeling very, very good. Friday on the Big Island. The Ironman is less than 24 hours away. Awaiting Kona, the most competitive field in the history of the race. And thus, plenty of tension. The party happens tomorrow. And first things first, I have my last meal. It's kind of like a death walk. Get your last meal before you get crucified. With my family, my friends. Always fun, have a good laugh, a couple of glasses of wine, so chill out, and big sleep, early to bed. Well, I think physically, the work's done. There's a nervousness as you get closer and closer and closer to the race, and an, and an anxiousness and an anxiety, but there's also, for me, a sort of an internal happiness. It's going to be a lot more family time come Sunday, so um, those mixed emotions. But I have a job to do, and I'm totally focused on that. Hey, good luck, Jamie. Good to see you, mate. Early dinner, I'll have a pasta with some chicken on top, load a bit of salt on there as well, and um, off to bed early to lay awake and think about the race all night. My mind is kind of constantly thinking about the race, kind of honing in on that mental preparation, I guess. There's no turning back, it's real. You know, you're locked in, you know, definitely get very nervous, and then obviously the morning of the race, um, <laughs> generally have trouble stomaching my breakfast sort of take a deep breath and take a step back and realize what you're here for. It's almost game time. The conditions here can rip this field apart. They're talking big trade wins tomorrow, so who knows? We well, put the head down tonight, try and get some sleep. You don't get much, you know, hug my wife, kiss my kids, wake up in the morning and uh, deliver what I try and do, and that's win races. Race morning in Kailua Kona is memorable and eerie. There's a lot of silence and some encouraging whispers. Everyone has their expectations. Some are public and some are private. You almost have to remind yourself they all want to do this. As the defending champion, Australian Craig Alexander wears number one. Coming off his best Kona appearance in 2011, a record-breaking performance at the age of 38. Alexander's back to try and defend his championship and claim a fourth Ironman world title, something only two other men have done. And they are Ironman legends. Dave Scott and Mark Allen. Alexander's main rival and two-time champion, another Australian, Chris McCormack. Number 11, thanks. Number 11. McCormack returns to Ironman after taking 2011 off in a failed attempt at making the Australian Olympic team. He's trying to flex, show a bit of muscle. Intimidate, yeah, that's all about intimidation. 
for the last five years, only McCormack and Alexander have won this race. Yet there's a third Australian amongst the pre-race favorites. His name is Pete Jacobs. Finishing second in 2011 behind Craig Alexander. He's a strong runner. He's had the fastest run split in Kona the last two years. The question is, can he be better on his bike? In 2010, Andreas Rayler came as close as Jacobs. He lost to McCormack in the last mile of the marathon. He's finished the top three here the last three years. It's time to be better. Another man looking for his first Kona win is Belgian Marino van Hollenacher. He became the fastest Ironman ever when he took the 011 Ironman Austria title in a record 7 hours 45 minutes. He knows this is an Austrian. At her Kona debut in 2009, Marinda Carfrey finished second, then won the race the next year. Chrissy Wellington has opted not to defend her title. That means in Wellington's absence, Carfrey is a pre-race favorite. So too is Leander Cave, arriving in Kona fresh off a first place finish at the 70.3 World Championship in Las Vegas. She was third here last year, behind Wellington and Carfrey. Switzerland's Caroline Steffen has been unbeatable in 2012, winning two championship events in Melbourne and Frankfurt. Kona insiders believe her destiny is the podium. Is this recording? Woody Fries is one of 100 athletes awarded their spot on the Big Island as part of the Ironman Legacy program. To qualify, a Legacy athlete must have completed at least 12 Ironman races. Woody's been trying to get to Kona for 22 years. For any long course triathlete, Kona is the, the benchmark, it's the Mecca. It's, I mean, it was the very first event. 591. It's funny, I have an M dot tattoo and people will see it. And the first question often is, have you done the race in Hawaii? Or have you done that race I saw on television? And having done 26 of these, I've always had to say no. And now I, I don't have to answer that question with a no. I can say, yes, yes, I've done Kona. I'm really looking forward to putting this on at the end of the race. In 2012, Julie Moss and Kathleen McCartney are simply age groupers, but 30 years ago, they helped put this race on the map. Julie Moss's finish was something America and the world had never seen before. The memories of that are still to come. So is the cannon that begins the race. The 2.4-mile swim begins on the east side of the Kailua Pier, roughly 60 yards from shore. The swim course is an elongated rectangle 1.2 miles long and 100 yards wide. Athletes swim south in a clockwise loop, keeping marker buoys on their right-hand side as they make their way to the turnaround point. Lane lines will mark the channel to the swim exit and the stairs into T1. The professional athletes that compete in the Ironman Triathlon World Championship head to the water for the tier swim course. The physical preparation is complete. Now it's time to see how the mental part went. Some are here to preserve what they see forever. Your mind has to be 100% willing and ready to hurt. You know, anyone who says it's just another race is full of crap and just trying to take the pressure off.
There are 84 pros in this year's race, 53 men, 31 women. Almost every one of them feels they have a legitimate shot at the podium. Some just better than others. What I go through my head is just my own personal battles and it's just really trying to shut off my head is, is what I really try to do in the race as opposed to think too much and uh, that seems to work really well for me. I can be sitting on my couch in Australia in February and close my eyes and I can smell Kona. I can get myself to a place where I feel the gun's about to go off in five minutes. We are moments away from the start of the pro man here in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii. I just like to present that feeling that Life is good, this is my house and I've done this a million times and uh, this is just another day at the office. For the first time ever, the pros have separate starts. The men will head off first. Five minutes later, the women will follow. The first few seconds of the race are critical. Everyone is fighting for a spot near the front. That is near the front, not necessarily at the front. A half hour after the pros, it's time for the age group athletes to enter the water. 1900 racers from over 60 countries. They've been thinking about this moment for a long time. Over 1,000 of them are here for a first time. There's over 60 countries, top 10 countries, Brazil, Japan, Belgium, Switzerland. As they dangle in the water, and as they've waited for their chance, they've all seen the huge swells crashing to the shoreline in Kailua Kona. While it may be calm here, they know the swells are coming, and swells mean it's going to be a tough go. They've heard about it. They've thought about it. They've seen it. Now it's time to live it. Welcome to the toughest swim start in the world. Now it's time to find some space and let the body do what it's been trained to do. And remember, this is only the first couple of miles. When it comes to the 2.4 mile swim of the Ironman World Championship, athletes rely on equipment and technique to gain a competitive edge. Swimsuits designed to mimic shark skin slice through the water and compress body circumference by up to 5%.
but technique is even more important. The alignment of the body as it rotates is key. Athletes use twice as much kinetic energy moving through the water on their stomach as they do on their side. Rolling from one side to the other transfers the power from the rotation to the propulsive arm allowing for a more efficient stroke. But the biggest advantage? Drafting. Swimming behind the person ahead of you. Drafting provides energy savings of 18 to 25 percent. Energy that may prove useful later in the day. Just over halfway through the swim, American Andy Potts and Estonia's Marco Albert have broken away. In 1996, Potts finished fourth at the Olympic trials in swimming's marquee endurance event, the 400 IM. He went on to compete in the Athens Olympics in 2004 as a triathlete. Another American, Amanda Stevens, is leading the women's race. Earlier this year in Germany, Stevens set the Ironman swim record. The All-American swimmer managed to finish med school while competing against the world's best. Just as she did a year ago, Stevens has opened up a gap on the rest of the women. As he nears the swim exit, Potts pulls away from Albert. seconds and every second counts now for the American nothing is going to get between him and his bike Estonian Marco Albert has had a great swim but not too far behind is a huge chase pack with many top contenders including defending champion Craig Alexander and last year's runner-up, Pete Jacobs, both from Australia. As Potts makes his way through transition, the chase group is a minute behind. He hurries to get to the bike course knowing the group behind him will be racing each other to get to their bikes. Just like the swim start, getting a good position out of transition is critical. There are 10 men getting to their bikes at the same time, including Pete Jacobs. Ahead of them, Potts is trying a tactic that has only worked for one other man, Dave Scott, 32 years ago, leading the swim and then winning the race. Ahead of the panic, Kona veteran Craig Alexander is out with Pete Jacobs and the lead chase group. Their rival, Chris McCormack, is not. Cormac out of transition is Ironman European champion Marino Van Hohenacker. After a year off, some think McCormack may have lost a bit of his edge. If you ask Van Hohenacker, he's lost a lot of it.
about four and a half minutes behind the leaders is the man they all fear on the bike, Ironman 70.3 world champion, Sebastian Keenly. While Potts still leads, his one minute advantage has virtually disappeared. Alexander racing in third has pushed the pace and closed the gap. But his countryman, Luke McKenzie, is riding even faster, taking the lead from Andy Potts. Potts held the lead for the entire swim, but within a few miles of the bike, the advantage is gone. Sitting behind is defending champion Craig Alexander, and behind him is the only man to run faster than he did a year ago, Australian Pete Jacobs. Chris McCormack has missed the main group and finds himself chasing right now. But there's still a long way to go in this Ironman. Amanda Stevens is first woman out of the water at 55.09. One, three, four, out of water, Amanda Stevens, our first female from Oklahoma City. The lead is less than a minute over fellow American Meredith Kessler. All right, Meredith Kessler, out of the water. Seconds behind her is Leanda Cave, a race favorite who finished third here last year. Just one month ago, she beat the best in the sport to become the 70.3 world champion. Can she do it again? Behind Cave is Mary Beth Ellis, who's won every Ironman she's entered, except this one. Two and a half minutes back is a group that includes number one ranked Caroline Stephan. Amanda Stevens keeps her lead through the first transition and is first of her bike. Amy Marsh leads Ellis and Kessler out onto the bike just behind Stevens. They're closely followed by Leanda Cave. As the top-ranked woman in the world, Caroline Steffen wears number 101, but right now she finds herself over two minutes behind the lead. But the women's race is just beginning. The Ironman's legendary 112-mile bike ride course begins with a short loop through the city of Kailua Kona, before turning onto the Queen K Highway, where athletes face the notorious Mamuku headwinds for more than 50 miles ride to the bike turnaround point in Harvey. Winds along this portion of the course have been known to reach 60 miles an hour in extreme conditions, and heat radiating off the lava and asphalt often sends temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. After the final seven mile uphill climb to the turnaround, athletes retrace the route back to the transition area in Kailua, Kona. Straight, flat, and hot. The legend of the Queen K Highway continues. Surrounded by lava and some cheers amidst the desolation, Luke McKenzie remains in front on the 112 mile trek bike course. Greg Alexander is still in third with Andy Potts just ahead, but not for long. Alexander flies into second place. Last year, he improved his bike time by 13 minutes with the fourth fastest bike time in Kona history. Pete Jacobs couldn't keep up with the bike leaders last year, but now he's with them. Marino Van Hohenacker was just over a minute behind Jacobs at the end of the swim. Now he trails by seconds. One of the race favorites, Andreas Rayler, didn't have the swim he hoped for, but is quickly making up time on the men ahead of him. 70.3 world champ Sebastian Keenly grew up training with Ironman cycling legend Thomas Hellriegel, and just like him, his goal is to break his competition on the bike. His first victim, Chris McCormick. Boys are pushing it up front. 
what a difference a year makes, eh? McCormack isn't having a great day, but Luke McKenzie is. Good form means a lot. When it comes to the bike, aerodynamics is everything. At 20 miles per hour, almost 85% of an athlete's energy goes into overcoming wind resistance. Triathlon bikes are specially designed to maximize a cyclist's efficiency by minimizing the effect of the wind. Aero bars allow triathletes to achieve a lower body position that reduces wind drag and allows them to save energy and ride faster, longer. Combined with an aerodynamic helmet, it adds up to a 3 miles per hour advantage. Over the course of 112 miles, that's 24 minutes saved over a standard road bike. The pros call that free speed. Back on the Trek bike course, a group of five women jockey for the lead. Amanda Stevens, Leanda Cave, Mary Beth Ellis, Amy Marsh, and Meredith Kessler. Stevens is in front. But Cave quickly steals the lead. And Kessler remains in play. The fact that Kessler is here is practically a miracle. Earlier this summer, she was in a bike accident and broke her back. Just a few months later, she's on her bike, and now she's leading the Ironman. Cave is happy to share time at the front, it seems. Racing in third now is Mary Beth Ellis, the Ironman Texas and New York champion. Catching the leaders is the sport's fastest rider, Caroline Steffen. She says she can win this race with the same tactics that won her championship races in Melbourne and Frankfurt, riding away from her competition. The 2010 champion, Marinda Carfrey, is now almost five minutes down, two miles behind. Stefan's race plans don't typically include a trip to the penalty tent. She accidentally got too close to a competitor and must now serve a four-minute penalty. Anything that can slow Stefan down bodes well for Carfrey and the rest of the women in the field. Stefan out of the picture, Cave takes advantage and moves to the front. With Kessler and Ellis close behind, they're all taking advantage of Stefan's time on the side of the road. As they near the end of the Queen K Highway, tactics begin to unfold. Pete Jacobs wants to keep the pace moving. He erases Frenchman Romain Guillaume and five-time Ironman champion Luke McKenzie to take the lead. Chasing Jacobs, Marino Van Hollenacker. Following his lead, also passing McKenzie. In his 10 Ironman wins, Van Hollenacker has led off the bike in all but one. As he heads up to Javi, he's moving to the front. Mark Allen has always said, headwinds can be managed, and a tailwind is always welcome. But sidewinds can be debilitating, and these riders are being jostled from all angles. Marino is just being better than the rest of the field. Swim exit, the 1900 age group athletes are finishing up the swim. 
Despite the rough conditions, some are swimming as fast as the pros, while others take the full two hours and 20 minutes. Amongst them is one woman who can honestly say she changed Iron Man's history. It happened 30 years ago on the very same Ali'i Drive the race will finish on today. It was really about digging down into the depths of your soul and finding more. It was spiritual. Yes, it was physical, but what people connected to was that idea of, could I do that? Could I try something like that? That was probably a pretty strong statement back in 1982. Now I think it's been the motto of the Iron Man: just get to the finish line. Thirty years ago, here I was a college student. I had watched the Iron Man. I was really intrigued. And I think being 23, I didn't know that things weren't possible. I was fearless. And I just thought, it's Hawaii. How bad could it be? And at one point, I was in the lead. But it just didn't register with me. And because I'm physically, emotionally invested, I started to really own the idea of winning something. All of a sudden, everything starts to just break down. But what went on in my mind was, I have to finish and there was a split second where it felt so good to surrender and just say, I can't do it. Just as I had that thought, there was this burning fire in me to just sit back up and find a way. And so every time I scrambled to get back up and I could manage a walk, then I had to go for the run because I wanted that moment. I had really started to crawl and thinking I still have a shot. I can see the finish line. And then in the, my peripheral vision, I saw those shoes and socks. That's her, she's here. And that moment, I'm completely devastated. I'm heartbroken. Just sick with the idea that this is now taken from me. I'm such a victim for about 10 seconds. And then it's like, get moving. Julie Moss embodied what all of us want to believe, that we will all go after what we want and go hard, even if plans change along the way. And it was a long transition to really own that moment and respect what people were trying to convey to me. You made me want to get off the couch and try an Ironman. And I think that's probably the reason I need to be back here after 30 years, because I own it now. I, I appreciate it, I love it, and I feel like it's my chance to sort of acknowledge all that support that came to me, just putting my heart and soul back into the course one more time, leave it out there, in a little less dramatic way, and I'm ready. I'm ready for what comes next. What is it that sets the Ironman World Championship apart? The elements, the heat, the humidity, and the winds. There's a reason they're legendary. Today, they are absolutely despicable. Battling those wins by himself is Marino Van Hohenacker, who now leads the men's race. But he has no idea what's brewing behind it. And what's brewing is Sebastian Keenly, the man he is passing, Faris Al Sultan, and then Craig Alexander are generating almost 600 watts of energy as they push on the pedal. Enough power to run your refrigerator. 
Kingley's power output could probably run your whole house. He continues to tick off racers. Luke McKenzie. Pete Jacobs. Frederick Van Luda. Which leaves only Van Hohenacker. Who is now at the turnaround in Hobby. It's strategy time. And this race, in this place, is really in his head. I really have to decide, okay, can I keep going with the risk of blowing up or just pull the plug and go for a top 10 plate, which is not bad, but that's not what I'm here for. And the only difference from the last few years, I'm not scared of losing anymore. At a turnaround like Javi, Van Hohenacker can see instantly what his lead is. It's only 34 seconds. Keenly's closing. Uh-oh. Far back on the course, Chris McCormack has made a decision. And the decision is to abandon. Between the Olympics and this race, 2012 is not Macca's year. The descent from Javi means tailwinds, strong tailwinds, something Van Hohenacker can truly enjoy. But the time for relaxing is over. And the two Europeans try to distance themselves from the rest of the field. Earlier this year, Van Hohenacker and Keenly came first and second at the Ironman European Championship. By working together now, they may be able to create the same scenario. The partnership is working, and they are pulling away. Then suddenly, an Iron Man reality. We got it, Chris. A darn flat tire. Where is this thing for the breakaway to? Where are they talking about, huh? There's no consoling Keenly. He's on his own. His head must be pounding at the sound of tick, tick, tick. Oh, it's a four minute, 39 second pit stop, and it's devastating. Keenly has to hope that something like this befalls Marino Van Hohenacker, who right now is alone at the front of the Ironman. And it's an alone kind of feeling he loves. Making the turn in Javi, Leander Cave is still leading the women's race. With Mary Beth Ellis right behind. Not there, but right behind. Remember that four minute penalty to Caroline Steffen? She's erased that in just 25 miles. It's a pace that leaves a former champion behind.
those super bikers are going to bike as fast as they bike and you know there's nothing you can do about it you've got to try and limit the damage and do what you can and then get off and hopefully be within reach these are what Marinda Carfrey is talking about super bikers Cave grabs her special needs bag and Ella slides in front and then suddenly it's Caroline Stefan back in complete control While the pros are on their way back down from Javi, the age group athletes are still battling the winds along the Queen K. And what an epic battle it is. Kathleen McCartney won here on the Big Island 30 years ago, passing a crawling Julie Moss to take the win. Just as she was in 1982, she's behind Moss out there on the bike. History can repeat. With temperatures still rising and a lot of course to go, staying cool is key. Woody Freeze dreamed of getting to Kona for 22 years. Did his dream include this much pain? Thirty years after crawling to the finish, Julie Moss is looking great. This is Brady Murray. Today is not about him. In July of 2007, my son was born, and about 10 minutes after, they told us that he has Down syndrome, and it changed my world. As I've got to know my son, I've realized that, that Down syndrome is not a bad thing by any means. It's a very special thing. He's a very loving child. He has a way to be able to connect with people in ways that nobody else has ever been able to do. Brady's courage has inspired Ironman finisher and MyList CEO Rob White, whose son Alex bonded with Murray over a shared love of triathlon. Together, MyList and Brady continue to drive awareness around a very personal cause. As a father of a child with Down syndrome, I had no idea that there were orphans throughout the entire world that are essentially abandoned at birth simply because of their disability. And knowing that literally there are hundreds if not thousands of orphans with Down syndrome throughout the world, and seeing this as an opportunity to be able to race for them, I jumped at it. And I thought, you know what? I may not be able to do an Ironman for myself, but I know I can do one for these kids. I know from experience as a father of a son with Down syndrome that the biggest blessing is not the child getting a family. It's the family that's going to get that child. They'll receive the biggest blessing in this. And that's ultimately the core of why I do what I do. For almost two hours, Marino Van Hohenacker has been riding out in front along the Queen K Highway. He's doing well, but the specter of the marathon always hangs over the great riders as they try and figure this race out. I hear it clicking, but you know, every year, the week before, you think, okay, we find that door. Now let's see if we can open it on race day. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't really open until now. Riding behind Ben Honacker is an Aussie on a roll, Pete Jacobs, pushing the pace in second and proving he's much more than just a great runner. In the women's race, Caroline Steffen is still in front. But Leanda Cave is doing more than just hanging around. Cave reclaims the lead, but somewhere in the last 20 miles, she's been hit with her own penalty, and she's going to have to spend some time in the penalty box. Her plan now has to be get as large a cushion as possible. As she's done all day, Mary Beth Ellis remains near the front of the pack as well. She's in third. As Stefan had to do earlier in the race, it's Cave's turn to serve her four-minute penalty in the tent. Sorry. A 
simple sorry and a red check is all she gets, in addition to whatever she carried inside. She's out, and riding four minutes behind. Right now, Ellis is comfortable riding behind her training partner, Stefan. It's a good spot to be. Ellis usually runs faster. And now, after losing time the first half of the race, Miranda Carfrey is battling back, aggressively closing time on the lead pack. Van Hohenacker arrives at the transition. The man he feared, Sebastian Keenly, suffered that costly flat tire. It dropped him from second to 11th. Among the men he's now chasing, 2005 world champion Faris Al Sultan. This race has pace, helping set it Aussie Pete Jacobs, who's got company. That would be Frederick Van Lierde, right on his wheel. Also there is Dirk Bockel. A week ago, he broke his hand during a hard training ride. Holding that bottle has to be complicated. Not in that group ahead of Keenly is Craig Alexander, more than 15 minutes back. But the way he runs still makes winning possible. Van Hohenacker exits the transition with no one else in sight. Here he comes. Van Hohenacker's best marathon time in Kona, 2.46. Jacobs can be six minutes faster than that. And as Pete Jacobs rolls into the transition, his deficit, eight and a half minutes. Something great is possible. Right behind him is Bockel, broken hand and all. Then Van Leerden. And finally, Farisal Sultan rounds out the chase group. As all that is happening, Van Hohenacker is more than a mile down the road. Keenly finally gets to the transition, 10 minutes back. It's a flat tire he'll never forget. He's followed by a proven runner, Andreas Raylert. In the women's race, Caroline Steffen is holding strong at the front. But she has not been able to shake Mary Beth Ellis. Ellis is primed to make her move to the front. As Ellis makes the pass, though, she gets too close to one of the male pros, Peter Vabracek. The officials just gave Ellis a penalty. So, like Cave and Stefan, she will have to serve a four-minute penalty in the next tent, which is in transition. All three women's leaders have been penalized. So, as long as Stefan saw the penalty flag, and she was right there, she knows all she has to do is stay near Ellis, and she'll have a four-minute lead to kick off the marathon. Stefan is just seconds back, but she'll be the first woman to run. In the transition, Ellis heads to the penalty tent. Stefan heads to the marathon. It has to give her a huge boost in confidence. Leanda Cave hits the transition just over four minutes behind Stefan. But thanks to the penalty, she'll only be seconds behind Ellis. And both of those women are usually faster runners than Caroline Stefan. But the fastest runner in the sport, Marinda Carfrey, is less than eight minutes behind.
On the K-Swiss run course, Marino Van Hollenacher remains in the lead, but he'll have to hang on for 20 more miles. Running fast is all about the numbers. After 112 miles of pedaling, the athletes hit the pavement. 170 steps every minute, 30,000 steps to the finish line. A lighter shoe can make an athlete faster, as much as three minutes faster with a four ounce reduction in weight. But there's a cost. Reducing weight means reducing cushioning, and the body pays that price. Every time the foot hits the ground, their body absorbs 600 pounds of pressure. That's as much as 50 tons of pressure every minute. Running fast is all about the numbers. Big, painful numbers. The 26.2 mile marathon begins at the Transition Air in Kailua Pier and travels up Polani Road to Kuakini Highway before making its way down to Ali Drive and the first turnaround point at St. Peter's Church. After the turnaround, athletes head north on Alihi Drive to Kailua Kona and up to the Queen K Highway for the long stretch to the final turnaround point in the Natural Energy Lab. The one mile climb out of the Energy Lab has a reputation as the place where the race is either won or lost. Then it's back to the highway and then after a short zigzag through town, they return to Alihi Drive and the final stretch to the finish line. Marino Van Hornacher is still leading the men's race. He's pushed himself beyond the limit before here in Kona. I always hear people talking about, yeah, 70% or sometimes 90% is the mind. I always said if I hear stuff like that, hey, it doesn't matter how strong your head is. If the legs say, <laughs> you're done, we're not working anymore, it, you're done. I've been shut down a few times here that I end up in an ambulance. I mean, am I mentally weak then? I don't think so. Up until now, Van Hohenacher has had the perfect race. But Pete Jacobs has closed the gap and is running with a point to prove. You know, I, I see Marino's name more than mine, and it's like, well, OK, he's, he's done well once, really. You know, this is the one time of the year where I get in really good shape, and I've proven that over the last few years. So I might not be picked by as many people, but it's not going to surprise myself if I end up doing well. Through the first 12 miles of the run, Jacobs is steadily gaining. But if you do the math, it's not happening fast enough. One of the mistakes people often make in the first part of the marathon is starting out too fast. Marinda Carfrey has managed to avoid that in the past. Certainly at the beginning of the run, I'm holding myself back because there's a lot of energy along Elite Drive. There's a lot of support, uh, friends, family. They can kind of <laughs> lift you to a false sense of your ability. <laughs> Marinda's weapon is her run, and that's every year she's been able to rely on that. I think that's my, been my downfall every year is my run, and because I think my bike and my swimming are, are right ne where it needs to be, and it's just going to be the marathon. I have to lay down a sub three hour marathon. So Carfrey's a concern, but so is Caroline Steffen, running the same pace as Cave, just three minutes ahead. 13 miles into the men's run, Van Hohenacher's body is not cooperating with his mind. A few minutes before, Jacobs might have been working on his runner-up speech. Now, he sees the chance of a lifetime firsthand. Ben Hohenacher is helpless. As Sebastian Keenly runs by, followed by Faris Al-Sultan. Pete Jacobs is almost 16 miles into the run at the infamous Energy Lab, which leaves Van Hohenacher with none. Raylert and Van Leerde go by. And suddenly their running talent makes this a close men's race. But with less than 10 miles to go, it's Pete Jacobs' race to lose. It's the hottest part of the course at the hottest time of the day. At over 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 66% humidity, it feels like it's well over 100 degrees. Pete Jacobs, on his way out of the energy lab, sees Sebastian Keenly in second place. 
The gap is five minutes. But Keenly has to worry more about staying in second than trying to win. Andreas Raylert has passed Faris Al Sultan and now has Keenly in his sights. Raylert has always finished on the podium when he's raced here in Kona, but he's never found a way to win. And right now, that's exactly what he's running for. He may be five minutes down, but if Jacobs falters even a little bit, Raylert will be right there. Keenly's feet moving fast but not enough to slow down the German. Also making a move out of the energy lab is Frederick van Leerde, now in fourth. Every time Miranda Carfrey has raced here in Kona, she's had the fastest marathon. As she's done every other year, she's catching the women ahead of her, including number 105, Mary Beth Ellis. Carfrey into third. And she can see Leander Cave. When Carfrey gets this close to her competition on the run, it's usually game over. Up ahead, Caroline Steffen makes the turn in the energy lab. Over the last three years, Steffen has spent more time at the front of the race than any other woman. Is today the day? In the men's race, it's Frederick Van Leerde who is now making a move. He's caught keenly. But the 70.3 world champion does not want to give up his spot. Van Leerde takes it anyway. Andreas Raylard still has visions of winning this race. But Pete Jacobs has a completely different finish in his mind. A slight smile says world championship. Meanwhile, Raylor can't worry about trying to win the race anymore. He needs to battle Van Leerde for the runner-up spot. And this turns into quite a battle. Out on the Queen K, Caroline Steffen continues to lead the women's race. But as we relearned in the men's race, those collapses can come at any time. Into and out of the energy lab, Leanda Cave has done what was previously thought to be impossible. She's held off a challenge on the run from Marinda Carfrey, and she's not going to stop there. Cave catches Steffen, but will have to earn the pass. unreal battle in the lead for the women's race. In the men's race, that happens for second. Meanwhile, Pete Jacobs passes the 25 mile marker, knowing he's got this race. But second is still wide open. When will the move come, and who will be the one to make it? It happens with just over a mile to go, and it's Frederick Van Leerde. Raylor was in this exact position two years ago and couldn't respond to Chris McCormack's move on this very turn. Once again, he has no response. Ali Idrad, the finish line. Heading into this race, many people figured Leander Cave had a chance to win. Earlier in the marathon, she held off the best runner in the sport. Right now, she's pulling away from the number one ranked Ironman athlete in the world, Caroline Steppen. For the third year in a row, Stefan has found herself being passed near the end of the marathon, and she drops to second place. 
Andreas Raylard is doing everything he can to get second. He recatches and now pulls away from Frederick Van Luden. The day, though, belongs to Australian Pete Jacobs. For the sixth straight year, the Ironman World Championship will be taken by a man from that country. like a smile and it should be on the face of Andreas Rayler proving that second place still means a lot he finishes second again and it takes everything he has Frederick Van Luda gets third Sebastian Keenly finishes fourth an outstanding Ironman debut Faris Al Sultan finishes fifth, his highest finish since 2006, and the first American was the swim leader Andy Potts. Running down the finishing chute in 12th place is the defending champion Craig Alexander. This was not to be Chris McCormack's year, it was not to be Craig Alexander's year. Their reign came to an end. Leanda Cave is about to do it. In 2007, she did her very first Ironman here in Kailua Kona and wondered what on earth she was doing here. She knows now what she's doing here. There's a strong feeling of deja vu as Caroline Steffen once again finishes second in Kona. Unbeatable everywhere else, she just hasn't quite cracked the Kona code. Marinda Carfrey usually doesn't struggle to finish the marathon, but every race is a new race. But get there she does. Sonia Tosic was the only woman to break three hours in the marathon. That got her up to fourth. Mary Beth Ellis in play all day finished fifth. And then across the line in sixth, the amazing 46-year-old six-time Kona champion, Natasha Bodman. The Ironman never ceases to amaze. Now that all the pros have made their way to Ali'i Drive, the race shifts back to the course to the hundreds of age group athletes trying to fulfill their respective dreams. Some of those dreams are meant to be shared. Ironman's Kona-inspired program launched in the U.S. this year, urging athletes to not let their stories go untold. Millions of people watched and voted online. In the end, eight athletes were chosen to compete in this year's race. I used the Kona-inspired competition as a way to publicly, for the first time in my life, uh, speak to the fact that I was a survivor of sexual abuse as a child. I'm here to show the countless numbers of other survivors who have come to me since I came out publicly. It's something to celebrate, and it doesn't really come from a pill and it doesn't come from talking to a counselor. It can come from something in your heart where you just believe that you can do something pretty impossible. <laughs> her courage on the road is nothing compared to what she's faced in life. A race like this is her therapy. Molly Serrano has finished three Ironman events in her life. While training for her fourth, she received some life-altering news. A little over a year ago, on June 2nd, 2011, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. To be honest with you, I looked at the odds and said, you know what, 
I can beat it. And it's been a challenge for me. I actually had a chemotherapy pump attached to me for six weeks through radiation where I just put in the back pocket of my jersey and continued to ride my bike. This time is gonna be even more special because I'm gonna be crossing that finish line as a pancreatic cancer survivor. I cannot wait to cross that finish line. Woody Freese, Ironman legacy athlete, is here realizing a lifelong goal. After 22 years in the sport, he's finally made it to his dream race. Awaiting Woody now, oppressive heat, and a 26.2 mile marathon on Kona's open roads. Years ago, my dad and I talked about this event. He passed away in 2001. And ever since then, I have made it a commitment to do this race in his honor. The emotional pendulum is swinging far and wide. I'm thrilled beyond belief. I'm thrilled beyond explanation. And at the same time, I'm petrified, scared to death. 30 years ago, Kathleen McCartney Hurst won the race that put the Ironman on the map. But the post-race chatter focused not on the champion, but the courage of runner-up Julie Moss. In 2011, Kathleen brought some focus back to her own life and decided she needed another Kona Ironman. She also realized that Kona would be incomplete without her former adversary. Well, I have to give credit to Kathleen McCartney Hurst for getting in touch with me, telling me she had specific reasons for being here. And I said, great, not interested in going back, but I'll support you on the journey. I really wasn't gonna let up until she said yes. Once she decided to do the race, we were gonna do this as training partners. We were competitors in 1982, we're collaborators in 2012. It's really not about how we finish against each other, it's how we finish together. And this journey has been together. Ooh, good job. It's really a dream. This has been an Iron Man dream. With nightfall descending on the Big Island, final challenges await all those age group triathletes who have one goal one focus to hear those magic words. As the parent of a Down syndrome child, Brady Murray knows the true meaning of this personal feat. He's raising awareness and raising money, providing an opportunity for a Down syndrome orphan. It's gonna mean life. It's gonna mean hope. It's going to mean that ultimately a family is going to be united with a child. And through the generosity of my list, this hope will become a reality. They have pledged the full adoption cost for a child. Because of Brady's determination, one of these children will be finding a home. That's why we do Iron Man. That's ultimately what it means by anything is possible. Sunset doesn't mean the end of the day, not even close. For hundreds of athletes in the field, including Ironman legend Julie Moss and Kathleen McCartney, there is a long road ahead and a midnight deadline looming. I'll see you at the finish line if you don't catch me. Okay. On 9-11, Rob Verhelst heard the call. He left his Wisconsin home and went straight to ground zero. His new mission? Finishing Ironman marathons in full uniform while raising money for his other firefighters. His goal tonight? A race against time. He's only got 90 minutes before the deadline. At mile 20, fireman Rob Verhelst's quest is far from finished. Even after two surgeries, Beth Ann Telford still battles brain cancer. 
she's had to learn to stand, walk, and run again. And I'll tell you, if I had to go an extra 10 miles tonight, I'd do it. I just can't wait to get to the finish line to see everyone and, and get to see the little girl from my hometown that's uh, battling brain cancer, because this is what it's about, the kids. It's all about hope. While the struggle continues on the Queen K, there's an ongoing party at the finish line. As you get closer and closer to the finish line, the crowds tend to be larger and you feed off of that. It's a sense of accomplishment that is just second to none. It's, it's just an amazing experience. You are an Iron Man, what are you waiting to get here? If you have to ask why, you'll never understand. 30 years ago, Julie Moss crawled across the finish line. Tonight, she finishes on her feet and on her terms. She now waits at the finish for her training partner and friend, and they are both an inspiration to all. To the champion here, 30 years ago, Kathleen McCarthy. I am a dreamer, and I am an Iron Man. I am doing this for burn survivors around the world. I'll be crossing that finish line in memory of my mom and for all the people living with ALS. She is an Iron Man! Crossing that finish line means hope. The most incredible feeling in the world, knowing anything is possible. I am a pancreatic cancer survivor, and I am an Iron Man. And just before midnight's deadline, fireman Rob Verhelst. Joining him at the finish line, women's champion, Leanne Cave. 